it was worth the trip. But we're glad to be home. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to talk with you about unyoking from unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. While you find your way there, um, just want to thank you for all of your prayers uh, and all of your giving towards phase two. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, maybe next week uh, some of the amazing things that the Lord has done for us. We had a little slow start to the construction. Um, it was because we were re-engineering a lot of the building and finding contractors to help us. And the Lord has done miracles for us. And we have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars off the cost of our construction. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Assemblies of God is a little upset with us because we haven't borrowed any money from them yet. And um, I'd just love to keep it that way. I'd love to get all the way through to the certificate of occupancy and say, gee, we're so sorry. We just didn't need any of your money. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? <clears throat> But right now, the plumbers are finishing up their work uh, doing the plumbing that's going to go under the slab. Uh, the concrete company is chomping at the bit to get into the site uh, and to begin forming the walls for the basement. We'll be pouring the walls. Uh, I think they'll start forming them at the end of the week. We'll be pouring them. And we're in a hurry now because the steel is on its way to us. Uh, to put up the basement level of the building. And as soon as that's up, we'll, that great big mountain of dirt out there, we'll get to push it back around the building and start to clean things up. So we are on the way now. And uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving. Uh, and uh, we're seeing it come to, to, together. All right, look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. How many of you know Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds? You know, everything in the Bible is important. Everything in the Bible is profitable for us, even if sometimes it's hard to hear. And uh, we have one of those words this morning. You know, I was away and Pastor Nick took up all the good verses in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, and he left me the hard verses in chapter 6. But uh, we have a word to share about unyoking from unbelievers. Look at me in 2 Corinthians 6. Look at the very end of verse 13. Paul says, I plead with you as my children, open your hearts up wide. Look at verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and lawlessness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Look at the first line of verse 2. Make room for us in your hearts. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come speak to us this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here, and we thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, the letter kills, but the spirit, it brings life. So I pray that you would breathe to us out of your holy scriptures. If your heart agrees with that, just say amen, amen. and amen. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know, in the history of the church, there has been... Uh, uh, very different reactions to the command that Paul gives here. For some, this command has been downgraded to the point of disregard. There are some believers who have no reservations about entering into a marriage covenant with an unbeliever or entering into different kinds of relationships and associations. For others on the opposite end of this spectrum, this command has been taken to an extreme of isolation from all unbelievers and even from other believers who maybe are a little different. To the extent that's possible, some have withdrawn completely from secular society. 
For the rest of us in the middle, this is a command that perhaps we really don't understand. We don't know what God expects of us and we don't know why. When Paul is speaking under the Holy Spirit and he commands us to be, uh, not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, what exactly is Paul telling us and why? Are we supposed to cut off as much as possible all ties with unbelievers? Are we forbidden from initiating new friendships or maintaining old friendships with unbelievers? Can we hang out with unbelievers? Can we participate in the things that they do? Should we end a marriage to an unbeliever? I can answer that for you right now. The answer is no. Should we break off a dating relationship or an engagement with an unbeliever? I can answer that for you. The answer is yes. Can we conduct business with unbelievers? Can we have business partnerships with them? Should we send our kids to public school? See, we need to know these are vitally important questions and we need trustworthy answers from the word of God. Fortunately, the answers are here. What is God telling us to do through Paul and why? There are two thoughts that help me make sense of these verses and I want to share them with you quickly and I hope they'll help you too. What is God telling us to do and why? Two thoughts. First of all, God wants you to know that you are different in the world. You are very, very different. In fact, there's a verse that calls you peculiar. Now, that actually means claimed. It doesn't mean strange. But the truth is, you are different. If you are a believer in Jesus, if you've turned away from your old life, if you've surrendered to his lordship, to his leadership, if you have received him by faith, then you are different. You're not the same as you were. You've changed. You're not the same as others in the world. You are set apart now. You're distinct and distinguished. You're no longer ordinary. You are extraordinary. After commanding us to unyoke from unbelievers, Paul fires off five stark comparisons in words that are familiar to a lot of us. What do righteousness and wickedness, the word is actually lawlessness, what do they have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of the living God and idols? You know, I grew up knowing these as the Halloween verses because these were the verses that they always used to explain to us why we don't participate in Halloween. What fellowship does light have with darkness? But I want to tell you that there's something even more profound than just being Halloween verses because each one of these comparison makes a powerful statement about our new identity in Christ. Paul is telling us with these words, who we are in the world. Who are you now? Well, first of all, Paul says, you are the righteousness of God. Once we were lawless, once we had no inclination in our heart to keep God's laws, and we had no strength to keep them, we couldn't do what pleases God, and we really didn't care. But when God called us to salvation in Christ, our lawlessness was exchanged for his righteousness. Pastor Nick shared with you last week those great words from chapter 5, verse 21. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to become sin for us on the cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, our lawlessness, with all of its penalties, was placed upon Jesus on the cross. And when we had that defining moment of faith in him, Jesus' beautiful righteousness and all its rewards and all of its benefits was placed upon us. God has declared us to be righteous. And God has taken away our old lawless heart and he has replaced it with a new heart of the new covenant that instinctively knows what pleases him and desires to do that. 
In him you are a new creation. Your inner nature has been transformed. Your character has been supernaturally upgraded. Your affections have been radically altered. You are different. You no longer share anything in common with lawless people because you are the righteousness of God. Who are you? Second, Paul says in these words that you are light. Once we lived in spiritual darkness, we belonged to the dominion of darkness. We were children of the night, Paul says. We lived in ignorance of God and of his only son, Jesus. We lived in ignorance of our dire spiritual condition and of God's offer of salvation. We lived in foolishness. We lived in fear. We were deceived. We were blinded by the God of this world. But then God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, caused his light to shine in our hearts. He showed us himself by showing us Jesus. And so we were rescued from the grip of spiritual darkness. God has made you light. God has made you a child of the light. You are filled with the knowledge of God revealed through his son, Jesus. You are filled with the truth of God. You are filled with the wisdom of God. You are filled with the power of God. You are filled with the purity of God. You are different and you no longer have intimacy with those who are still in the darkness because you are light in the Lord. Who are you? Third, Paul says with these words that you are Christ's. You belong to him. Once we were under the power of Satan. Once we were owned by him. We were enslaved by him. We were influenced by him. Paul uses a very interesting title here for Satan. He uses the title Belial. That's a Hebrew word that means worthless. You know, under Satan's control, people are driven to pursue all kinds of things that are ultimately worthless in the light of eternity. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Beloved, can I tell you, a brilliant career is worthless if you miss heaven. Amen. A beautiful body is worthless if you miss heaven. Amen. A big portfolio is worthless if you miss heaven. So you might as well transfer some of that for phase two so we don't have to borrow any money from the assemblies of God. A pampered life is worthless if you miss heaven, a picture-perfect family is worthless. If any of you miss heaven, even noble humanitarian accomplishments, they're worthless if you miss heaven. Paul said, don't you be like those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. We were like that, but now Christ has conquered our hearts. He has become our conquering general, leading us in his triumph parade. Our lives are no longer devoted to worthless pursuits, but to the pursuit of things that endure for all of eternity. We are Christ's. We have become his valuable possessions. He has anointed us. That's a sign that we have been separated for a divine purpose. He has put his seal of ownership on us. He's given us the precious Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is yet to come. You are different. There is no harmony between you and those who still belong to Belial because you are Christ's. Who are you? Fourth, Paul says that you are designated by God as a believer. This is my favorite one right here. You see, once we were unbelievers, once we were people without faith, we were people who lived by sight. Pastor Nick shared about that so beautifully from chapter 5. Once we viewed Christ through unbelieving eyes, once we measured the worth of others based on a scale of earthly values, but now we have become believers in him. Now we live by faith. You know, faith pleases God because it's an acknowledgement of who he is. 
Faith is the doorway through which we enter into a relationship with God through Christ. Faith is the means through which the saving work of Christ on the cross is personally appropriated to each one of us. Faith is the means through which we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. And faith is the means through which we continually experience the overflow of the Spirit with miracles and signs and wonders. Faith is the key by which we access all the riches of God in Jesus Christ. Now I want to tell you it is good to be designated by God as a believer. The Bible says Abraham believed God. And God saw that he was a believer. God designated Abraham as a believer and it was counted to him for righteousness. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Listen, when God designates you as a believer, he blesses you in every way that he blessed Abraham. He raises every dead thing in your life and he calls those things as not as if they were. Jesus said everything is possible to the one who believes. You know, you might be wondering, do I have enough faith to resurrect my dead marriage? Do I have enough faith to see my spiritually dead children come alive in Christ? To see my grandchildren come alive in Christ? Do I have enough faith to see my dead career or my dead finances come to life again? Do I have enough faith to see my sick body get well again? Do I have enough faith to see phase two finished after 17 years slugging away at it? Listen, God has designated you as a believer. That means that all the faith you need is there. You don't have to muster up the faith. You just have to believe that you're a believer. And when you hear those words of Jesus, everything is possible to the one who believes. You can say, whoopee, that's me. God has called me a believer. You are different. You have no stake in the carnal lifestyle of unbelievers because God has designated you a believer. Who are you? Fifth, Paul says in these words, you are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit. Once we were idolaters. Once our hearts were dominated by the desire for all kinds of things other than God. Do you know all the idols of the ancient world were really just embodiments of the things that we still crave today? If you crave success, there was an idol for that. If you craved prosperity, there was an idol for that. If you craved power or status, if you craved health, if you craved peace or pleasure or sexual prowess, there were idols for that. If you craved children and a legacy, there were idols for that. You know, all those things are actually good gifts that come from the Father above. But if we put any one of those things ahead of him, it becomes an idol. We were idolaters, but now we have been transformed into the holy of holies of the living God. The Greek word that Paul uses in verse 16 of chapter 6, it's a very specific word. It's not the word for the entire temple building. It's the word specifically for the holy of holies where God's manifest presence dwells. You know what that means? That you're the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit? That means that God's location has changed on the earth. You know, God used to dwell. God is everywhere all the time. But his manifest presence, it used to dwell in a cube-shaped room in the temple on a mountain in Jerusalem. But now his manifest presence can be found in the heart of every believer in in Jesus. And it's found wherever we're gathered together. Ever since I was a boy, I was taught, don't do this and don't do that because... You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, as a kid, I never found that very inspiring. (laughs) But, But let me put it to you like this. You are the location of God's manifest presence on the earth. 
Do you know what that means? That means if someone wants to find God, he doesn't need to get on a plane and fly 11 or 12 hours to Jerusalem. All he has to do is find you and he can access the presence of God. All of us gathered here in this sanctuary today in his name. We are now the location of God's manifest presence on the earth. If someone needs to experience God, if someone's looking for him, if someone wants to find God, all they have to do is find us and they will find his presence. Do you realize how wonderful that is? Do you realize how powerful that is? God is now widely accessible to others on earth because he's in you, he's in me, he's in all of us together. You are different. You are not in agreement with idolaters because you are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit. After those five comparisons, Paul moves quickly to a string of six scripture quotations that continue affirming that we are different. As God has said, I will live with them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. Who are you? Six, Paul is saying through these scriptures, you are on your way home to God's house. There's a great promise that's repeated again and again. In the old covenant, it's repeated in the new covenant. I will live among them. I will dwell among them. That promise finds its fulfillment in the very end. John gets a peak glimpse at the very end of the book of the new heaven and the new earth. And he hears a voice coming from the throne of God that says, Now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them. He will be their God and they will be his people. It's a promise that begins now, but it finds its ultimate fulfillment in that day when we are forever with him in heaven. And just like the children of Israel traveling through the wilderness right now, you and I, we are on a journey towards that permanent home, that permanent dwelling with him. Paul said right now we live here on the earth in temporary tents of human flesh, but over there we're going to put on a permanent spiritual building. And while you and I are on this journey homeward, God is escorting us every step of the way. God is with us and his presence with us guides us. His presence with us provides for us. His presence with us protects us. His presence with us gives us peace. While we're on this journey homeward, we are already adopted into his family. We're under his care. We're under his protection. God said, I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and my daughters. That means that we're his kids. We belong to him and he's going to use all the resources he has to care for us. He's going to use all the strength he has to help us. He's going to use all the power he has to defend us. I like these verses. God says in these verses to you, I'm daddy, but to those who mess with you, I am the Lord God almighty, the captain of the angelic hosts of heaven. And that's why David could say with confidence, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid because you are with me. Who are you? You are different. You are very, very different. You are the righteousness of God. You are light. You are Christ. You are a believer. You are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit. You are on your way home to God's house. And finally, you are headed towards a day of completion and reward. Paul spoke earlier about the fear of the Lord. And he mentions it again here in chapter 7, verse 1. Beloved, since we have these promises, let us cut off everything that contaminates body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion out of reverence for God. You see, everything that we're experiencing here on earth as believers, it is all leading up to a great culmination. 
It's leading up to a great day of the Lord when his work of righteousness in us will be fully completed and permanently completed. Everything we're going through is leading up to a day when we will lay hold of the object of our faith. Everything we're going through will lead up to a great day when we see the one in whom we have believed and to whom we belong. Everything we've been going through is leading up to a day when we will lay claim to our promised inheritance, when we will be clothed with our new spiritual body, when we will receive reward from him for every act of faithfulness and service. You are different in the world. You are very, very different. Your heart is different. Your inner nature is different. Your character is different. Your affections are different. Your mindset is different. Your values are different. Your goals are different. Your allegiance is different. Your religious experience is radically different. And your destination is different. Beloved, believe that. Receive that, embrace that, celebrate that, live that. You are different. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What is God telling us to do and why? There's two thoughts. The first one is that God wants you to know that you're different. The second one is this. Since you are different, then be different. What does it mean to be unequally yoked? to an unbeliever. This is a metaphor that points back to the Old Testament when God forbade two types of different types of animals to be yoked together for work. For example, God specifically forbade to yoke a donkey with an ox. You know, such an act would be cruel. Such an act would be unproductive. Oxen are much bigger and stronger than donkeys. A donkey can't keep up if it's yoked to an ox. It can easily get injured, perhaps fatally injured, and it's not productive. They can't move together at the same pace. They won't get the work done that needs to get done. It was also forbidden to crossbreed two different species of animals. Again, such an act would be cruel. It could lead to trauma. It could lead to injury, and it won't produce anything useful. Furthermore, it would mess with God's created order. You should think about this. God designed every species of animal with a male and a female counterpart so that they could procreate after their own kind. And God doesn't like it when we mess with his created order. When we do so, we defy his authority as creator and we usurp his authority and we try to take his place. By extension of the same principle, it was also forbidden for Israelites to marry outside of their Jewish faith. But what does this metaphor mean for us today? Well, first of all, based on everything that Paul has already said, we can be sure of what it does not mean. It does not mean that God wants us to sever all ties with unbelievers. It does not mean that we cannot befriend unbelievers. It does not mean that we cannot work for and work with unbelievers. It doesn't mean that we can't enter into contracts with unbelievers. It doesn't mean that God wants us to withdraw from society. Paul said we are ambassadors of Christ. God makes his appeal to people personally through us. We are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit where unbelievers can encounter the presence of God. Jesus said we are salt and we are light in the world. We can't be any of those things if we withdraw from society. This metaphor doesn't mean to withdraw, but it does mean that being different in the world might require that some of our associations, some of our affiliations, Some of our personal relationships must fundamentally change in nature. Some of them must be cut off completely, and some of them must never be initiated. What constitutes a yoke? When it comes to our personal relationships, casual friendships are not a yoke. Cordial relationships with neighbors, with coworkers, with clients, that's not a yoke. A yoke implies a few things. First of all, a yoke implies a common master. 
Secondly, a yoke is a bond that is not easily broken. You can't get out of a yoke easily once one has been put upon you. And third, a yoke is a loss of freedom to act independently. So what constitutes a yoke? Well, for one thing, a marriage covenant is certainly a yoke. Beloved, listen, as followers of Jesus, we are strictly forbidden from entering into a new marriage covenant with someone who is not a believer in Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if you're a believer, you're free to marry, but your spouse must belong to the Lord. Now, I didn't say that. God said it through the Apostle Paul in Scripture, so don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what the book says. If you're a believer already, and you're in a marriage with a relationship with an unbeliever, Paul says stay in that marriage. As far as it depends on you, keep the marriage together and try to win that unbelieving spouse to the Lord through your prayers and through your godly lifestyle in front of them. If you're married, you're also forbidden from pursuing any kind of friendship or any kind of relationship that would undermine your marriage or violate your marriage vows. And beloved, listen, if we are forbidden from entering the yoke of marriage with an unbeliever, that means that we are also forbidden from entering engagement with an unbeliever. And it also means we really shouldn't seriously date an unbeliever. Now listen, I believe in missionary dating. I, some of the best people I've known in the body of Christ came to the Lord that way. But, you know, if nothing's happening spiritually after the first couple of dates, just cut it off, all right? <laughs> Single brothers, I want you to listen to me. If she will not follow your spiritual leadership while you're dating, she will not follow your spiritual leadership after you get married. And you will find yourself in the cruel and in the painful and the unproductive situation of being unequally yoked. Single sisters, please listen to me. If he will not take spiritual leadership while you're dating, he will not take spiritual leadership after you're married and you will find yourself in the cruel and the painful and the unproductive situation of being unequally yoked. There are other things that constitute a yoke besides a marriage. A possessive friendship constitutes a yoke. You know, there are few things in life that influence us more than our close friendships. Our friendships affect how and where we spend the best time of every week. They affect what we discuss. They affect what we dwell upon. They affect our views and our values and our decisions. An intimate friendship with an unbeliever doesn't have to be an unequal yoke, but it can become an unequal yoke if the friendship creates an obstacle to you living as the different person that you really are. Let me put it to you this way. If a friendship causes you to act like the old you rather than the new you in Christ, then it is an unequal yoke. What constitutes a yoke? A business partnership might constitute a yoke depending on the nature of it, depending on the integrity of it. If it puts you in a position as a believer where you have to act in a way that is unscrupulous, that's unethical, that's unlawful, then it's an unequal yoke. A counseling relationship definitely constitutes a yoke. If the counselor is an unbeliever and the counselee is a believer, I want to tell you, off the bat immediately, it is an unequal yoke. You see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the guidance of those who don't acknowledge him, who don't honor him, who don't submit to him is worthless in light of eternity. A mentoring relationship, a life coaching relationship, wellness coaching relationship. If you have a relationship with a sensei, with a grandmaster, with a yogi, all of those things constitute yokes. A trustee relationship, a guardianship, power of attorney. Listen, membership in lodges, membership in fraternal orders or secret societies, those are yokes that must definitely be broken. Deep affiliation with and allegiance to a political party could constitute a yoke. If participation in the party puts you in a situation where you're coerced to support the spread of lawlessness in our society, that is an unequal yoke. 
as technology changes, the way that we relate to people has changed dramatically. And so it might not be that a yoke is with any individual or any specific group, but we might become yoked to a particular ideology or to a particular set of secular values that run counter to the word of God. You know, you can be yoked to someone's philosophy, to someone's idolatry through his music, through his lyrics, through his literature, through his art. Carry on, my wayward son. There'll be peace when you are done. Um, no, there won't. When it comes to what constitutes a yoke, there are some things that are explicitly addressed in Scripture, and there are other things that we need to determine based on the principles in the Word and with the help of the Holy Spirit. But let me say it this way. A yoke is any kind of relationship or association that significantly forms our identity, and an unequal yoke is any kind of relationship that hinders us from following the Lord in all things. And since we're so different in the world... Why wouldn't we want to follow him in all things? Why is it so important that we unyoke ourselves from unbelievers? I'm going to throw three things at you fast and we're done. Why is it important that we unyoke ourselves from unbelievers? Worship team, you can come help me. First of all, unyoking from unbelievers is necessary for the completion of our holiness. As we have said, we are on a journey towards a final destination. We are headed towards a day of completion and reward. We're growing from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory. We are in pursuit of what is eternal. And to become intentionally yoked together with an unbeliever in a marriage or in any other kind of association is cruel. Someone is going to get hurt. It messes with God's established order. It's frustrating. Not only is it unproductive, but for the believer, it's counterproductive. You see, here's the thing. If you're yoked in some way with an unbeliever, you cannot force that unbeliever forward in the direction of your new life in Christ because only in Christ could he go there. So the only alternative is that unbeliever is going to hold you back. Looking at that list of comparisons, here's what you will experience in an unequal yoke. You'll have a common interest problem. You won't share very much in common. Paul says, what does righteousness have in common with lawlessness? The truth is nothing. You'll have a harmony problem. You won't have peace in your relationship. You won't have peace in your home. You won't have peace in your interactions. Paul says, what harmony is there between Christ and Belial? You'll have an agreement problem. You won't agree on priorities. You won't agree on direction. You won't agree on goals. You won't agree on where you're going and how to get there. You won't agree on how to invest your resources of time and money. Paul says, what agreement is there between the temple of God and idols. You'll have a preoccupation problem. See, you are the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit. You are preoccupied by the presence of the living God, but unbelievers are preoccupied by idols. In chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says that the completion of our holiness requires that we cut off some things that defile our body and our spirit. The English word in the Bible is purify, let us purify ourselves. But the word Paul actually uses is cut off. It's the same word Jesus used when he said, whatever leads you into sin, cut it off. It's the same word he used when he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, my father cuts off, while every branch that does bear fruit, he cuts clean. And what God specifically requires us to cut off here is the unequal yoke with unbelievers that impedes our journey towards home and towards that great day of completion and reward. Beloved, listen to me. There is a day coming in the end where we will be uh, permanently and tragically separated from unbelievers. But that process of separating from them, it begins now. Why is it so important to unyoke from unbelievers? Second, Unyoking from unbelievers is necessary for unreserved devotion to God's family. 
I want you to notice something with me. This whole section about not being unequally yoked, it begins and it ends with a plea from Paul to the Corinthians. He's pleading with them to open their hearts fully to him and to God's family. Chapter 6, verse 13, I plead with you as my children, open your hearts to us. Chapter 7, verse 2, on the other end, make room for us in your hearts. You see, the Corinthians, they were struggling to commit all the way to Paul and all the way to God's family because they refused to cut off some associations and some relationships that required that they go into pagan temples for social events and for business events and for civic events. And Paul is saying, so long as you refuse to give up the one, you will never be wholeheartedly committed to the other. Here's the tweetable line of the day. Pastor Nick thought it was too, line, too long to tweet, but I proved him wrong. I tweeted it. If you refuse to separate from ungodly people, eventually your heart will separate from God's people. That's good preaching right there. Why is it so important to unyoke from unbelievers? Finally this. Unyoking from unbelievers is necessary for our mission of reconciliation. Listen, this is a little counterintuitive, but listen. Separation from the world is absolutely necessary for our mission in the world. Listen, we don't unyoke ourselves because of pride. It's not that we have suddenly become better than unbelievers. We're all just sinners saved by grace. We don't unyoke because of fear. It's not that we're afraid of unbelievers. Greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. We unyoke ourselves because of our ultimate destination and because of our mission. Paul says, since we have these promises, let us cut off the things that might prevent us from completing holiness. What promises is he talking about? Well, certainly the promise of adoption, certainly the promise of an eternal home in heaven, the promise of being received by the Father, the promise of being rewarded. But he's also thinking of the promise that we are competent ministers of the new covenant in the world. The promise that we are ministers of a better covenant that is still full of the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lives. The promise that we are the aroma of Christ everywhere, the aroma of life among those who are being saved. The promise that God makes his personal appeal to unbelievers to receive salvation through us. The promise that we are God's location on earth, the holy of holies of the Holy Spirit, where people can experience him. You see, we can only be all of those things. We can only realize the fulfillment of those promises if we're willing to let go of our idols because God will not share this space with an idol. Beloved, since we have these promises, let us cut off from ourselves everything and every yoke that defiles us so that we might bring holiness to completion out of reverence for God. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What is God telling us to do and why? God is telling us you are different in the world, so be different.